been kind of an emotional weekend for me. I'm really surprised. I don't normally get real emotional, and certainly not on Sundays. I, I don't, but, you know, you saw the couple in the video the working with the kids. We, we had a, uh, a renewal of their vows ceremony yesterday for their 25 years together. And, uh, you know, I just, I just thought about, you know, how, how many of us have been together for decades They've been here 22 years, and you know. And then during the time they were uh, the of the party situation, they were having people come out and dance. And and when the the uh, the MC would say, "Okay, anybody been married 10 years or or less, leave the dance floor." And they got to 20 and 25, and whoever's been married for 35 years, leave the dance floor. And I and looked at the people that were left, and and I thought, "Gosh, we've been married 35 years, and those people look really old." I, I said. I said, Darnell, do we look that old? And she says, well, you do. <laughs> you know, I, I, I reconnected with a, a friend of my daughter, Lisa's, and that's emotional. And, you know, I think about pastor appreciation and, and uh, you know, you express appreciation of the pastors, but I know how much all of us pastors appreciate all of you. And... Uh, seen a lot of people over the years. In 35 years, a lot of people have come and gone, but it's the people that stayed that really carry the biggest impact and really mark people's souls. And, and that's what we want to be. We want to be people that, uh, like we sang here, when we, when we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. And the reason the word's still together is because we, we just simply made that decision, no turning back. The cross before me, you know? That, that's what we live for. And... Uh, you know, it's just, like I said, it's kind of an emotional weekend for me. I'm kind of surprised because I'm usually hard-hearted and have very few emotions, but, but it's been one of those weekends. And I thought, you know, really, that, that song that we sang, you know, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Have you ever felt like turning back? I felt like turning back a thousand times. I could have turned back a thousand times, but the grace of God keeps us on the course, keeps us on that straight and narrow path. And I thought, you know, that's kind of similar to what we're reading about in this series called The Journey. We've titled this series through the, gospel, or through the, uh, the book of Joshua, The Journey, because Israel was on a journey, a journey that lasted many lifetimes. But every lifetime, every life is a journey. We saw Moses lead Israel out of bondage and slavery in Egypt into the desert, and then for 40 years they wandered the desert in disbelief. And then we saw Joshua take the people from the desert, the people of Israel, and lead them into the promised land. And he would be the one that God set apart that says, you're not only going to hear about my promises. You're not only going to long for my promises, you're going to possess my promises. I'm going to use you, Joshua. You're going to lead God's people, my people, into possessing the promises that I've given them so long ago. And that's really what this series is all about, how to possess the promises of God in the journey called our lives. We saw the last couple of weeks that Israel went into the promised land, crossing the Jordan, defeating Jericho when God brought those walls down, going to the next city, that small city called Ai, and there suffered a great defeat. So they had one victory and one defeat. And in chapter 9, Joshua continues the process of possessing God's promises. And it is a process. It's a lifelong process to possess all of the promises of God. You have some promises the first day you cross that line of faith and become a Christian. You have the promise of salvation. Your soul is secure. You've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. From an eternity separated from God to an eternity spent with God. That promise is given the moment you raise the white flag of surrender over your life and you trust Jesus. But from then on, Every other promise, it seems, is a process. Thank God Joshua didn't stop after his great victory. A lot of people stop when they win a good victory. And he didn't stop when he suffered his great defeat at Ai. A lot of people stop when they suffer a great defeat. He wasn't going to settle for part of the promise. And I love that about Joshua. He wanted everything God said he could have. And that's what I want for all of us. I don't want us to stop short. I want us to possess all of God's promises. That's what we devote our one and only life to serving Jesus for. Pursue and possess all of God's promises. Pursue the fruit of the Spirit. 
That's a promise from God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Pursue the gifts of the Spirit, not just the fruit of the Spirit, but the gifts of the Spirit, the power to live the Christian life. Pursue guidance and strength and joy and hope and provision and protection and purpose in life. These are the promises that God has made in the Bible. And don't settle for anything less. Because in this day and age, it seems like people become addicted to mediocrity. And good enough seems good enough. But to the life of a believer who's pursuing all the promises of God, good enough isn't. Some people just get that God thing out of the way, and now I'm a Christian and I'm saved, and that's good enough, and I'm going to go on and live my life and captain my own ship and chart my own course and live the way I want to. That's mediocrity. In Joshua chapter 9, after the great victory in Jericho and the great failure in Ai, we read in verse 1, Now when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, those in the hill country, in the western foothills, and along the entire coast of the great sea as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites and Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they came together to make war against Joshua and Israel. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. The men put worn patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal, and he said to him and the men of Israel, We've come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. The men of Israel said to the Hivites, But perhaps you live near us. How then can we make a treaty with you? We are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, Who are you and where do you come from? And they answered, Your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sion, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reign in Ashtaroth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, Take provision for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you, but now see how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that were filled were new, but see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. The men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors living near them. So the Israelites set out and on the third day came to their city, their cities, Gibeon and four others I can't pronounce. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders. This was not Pastor Appreciation Month. But all the leaders answered, We have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. This is what we will do with them. Do to them. We will let them live so that the wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath we swore to them. They continued, Let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers for the entire community. So the leaders promised to them was kept, And then Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said, Why did you deceive us by saying we live a long way from you while actually you live near us? Now you are now under a curse. You will never cease to serve as woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. And they answered Joshua, Your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out all its inhabitants from before you. So we feared for our lives because of you, and that is why we did this. We are now in your hands. Do to us whatever seems good and right to you. So Joshua saved them from the Israelites, and they did not kill them. That day he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the community and for the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose, and that is what they are to this day. The people of Gibeon hear not only about Joshua, and the Israelis and their powerful army, but the God that delivered them from Egypt and sustained them 40 years in the desert and brought them across the Jordan into the promised land and gave them two defeats of, of, of Jericho and of Ai. And 
they became afraid. It says that they believed in the God of Israel and they were afraid. I thought, man, that describes a lot of people today. People who believe in Jesus. People who are afraid of God. They, they do certain things or they, they, they prohibit themselves from doing other things because they fear God, but they don't serve God. They don't love God. They don't know Him. They don't honor Him. They don't devote their one and only lives to Him. They aren't fully devoted followers of Jesus. They believe in God, and they fear Him, but they don't serve Him. It just reminds me of all the stories that we read in the Old Testament, how applicable and relevant and timely they are for today, because the human character really doesn't change much, hasn't changed in the human history since Genesis. The Gibeonites knew that they couldn't defeat Israel by an open attack, so they turned to deception. They put on old clothes. They wore sandals that were worn out and cracked. They had cracked wineskins and dry, moldy bread, trying to appear like they'd come from a long ways away. They used deception to gain entrance among God's people. They used deception because they knew the safest place to be was among God's people. I wonder if the people in our lives know that today. Do they feel safe around Christians? Or do they wait for the Christians to put a finger in their face in a judgmental attitude, full of criticism and intolerance, and say, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. You know, you got to hand it to these Gibeonites. I mean, I, I kind of I respect them, you know. They used deception, but, but they did it for noble causes, for personal safety. You know, the New Testament portrays Satan as a roaring lion, roaming around seeking whom he may devour. But the New Testament also portrays Satan as a, as a subtle serpent. Satan does three things in the Bible. We're told that he accuses, we're told that he tempts, and we're told that he deceives. Satan is still trying to infiltrate the church today. We know that Paul told the Corinthians, for such men are false prophets, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. There are men and women that stand on stages with microphones who are self-centered, false teachers, false prophets with false doctrine, trying to make godliness a means for gain. And we've got to know who they are. We've got to be able to discern who they are. Jude 4 says, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and denied Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. This, this scenario is rampant. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the last days, people will gather teachers among themselves, people with itching ears to hear, whatever the, to hear from teachers who will tell them whatever they want to hear. That you, 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 know, you can always be wealthy, you can always be healthy, you can always be victorious. That's not real life. And it's not real doctrine. Don't be led astray. You know how you don't be led astray? You know how you don't be led astray? Do you know how not to be led astray? Know the Word of God. Study to show yourself approved. Jesus said you, you're in error because you don't know the Bible. You don't know the Scriptures. Listen, if, if this is all you get of a scriptural diet every week, you're on starvation rations of the Word of God. Know the Word of God. And discernment is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, ask, inquire of God. You know, if you hear something from this stage from me or anybody else and it just doesn't feel right, come to us. Challenge it. Go to the Word. We are not offended by people who question, challenge, or even disagree at times. But discernment is a gift that God will provide to allow us to not only understand true doctrine, but be able to identify true teachers. And then common sense is not a, a, a lack of faith. Some people think that there's, you know, when you become a Christian, you have to jettison all common sense and intellect. Common sense says that if God wants everybody wealthy, well, what do you, what do, you do with a Christian in Somalia? How do you convince them? What, they're going to get two cows instead of one? I mean, it doesn't even make sense. If the gospel can't be preached everywhere in the world, it shouldn't be preached anywhere in the world because the true gospel is a universal gospel. Again, the Israelites and Joshua failed to consult with God. 
And they're just now recovering from that very same mistake. That's what caused their defeat at Ai. They thought, we can handle this. We can just, we don't need to seek God on this. We're going to make this call ourselves. And yet Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. And he said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. He said, another place, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. It's, it's so easy to go through life without really consulting God in the process. And that was the mistake Joshua and the Israelites made. And there's only one thing worse than not seeking God's will. It's not obeying God's will when you discover it. It goes on in chapter 10 of Joshua. It says, Now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all of its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, and a couple other dudes, Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites and the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. Five kings, five cities, each city had its own king. Five cities gathered together to make war against Gibeon for making a peace treaty with Israel. Warring cities joined forces to attack them. Common occurrence all over the world. The entire Arab world is against Israel. Because what they've done is they've united, they've joined forces to attack a common enemy. The, the idea is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. You've heard it. And so enemies in this time of the promised land join forces to fight a common foe, the Gibeonites. And I read that and I thought, you know, if enemies unite to fight a common foe, shouldn't friends do the same thing? If enemies unite to fight a common foe, shouldn't Christians do the same thing? And you know, the enemy isn't the other Christians. The churches that believe some things that we don't believe and do things different than we do and act different than we act, they're not the enemy. They're, they're the ones we're supposed to be uniting with. Anybody who names the name of Christ as their Savior is our friend, not our enemy. And we need to be a united force with them to fight the true enemy Satan and, and the world standards oftentimes and human nature and the flesh. We've got to be united. Jesus said a house divided cannot stand. And, and if that's true, and it is because Jesus says it, then a house united can't fall, can't fail. Verse 4 says Gibeon had made peace with Israel. And the minute they made peace with Israel, they declared war with the rest of the Canaanite cities and kings. When you make peace with God, it puts you at war with the world and its standards, and its ways. James 4 says, Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, what does it mean to be a, a, a friend of the world? It means to buy in to the mindsets, the political correctness, the standards. When the world says right is wrong, or wrong is right, it's to buy into that. That's being a, a friend of the world. But to take a stand... The Bible says many times God told Joshua, be strong and take a stand. You take a stand for godly standards by living a godly life, by speaking the truth in love. You don't have to stand on the corner and shout at people. You don't have to be the biggest jerk you can possibly invent yourself into being to take a stand to tell the world they're wrong. Speak the truth, but do it in love. Be strong in your faith and be willing to take a stand. It says in verse 6, the Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Horon, 
and cut them down all the way to Ezekiel and Makeda, I think. And they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Ezekiel. The Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the Israelites. Moral of the story, don't get in a snowball fight with God. How freaky would that be? You're, you're chasing an army. They're running from you. You're going you're gonna, to, all of a sudden, God starts raining down hailstones and kills more of them than your army did. You know, when the Gibeonites cried out for help from Israel and Joshua, Joshua's integrity was tested once again. Would he honor his allegiance, his commitment to the Gibeonites, even though they deceived him, and would he fight to protect them? You know, he could have rationalized that away, said, hey, they lied to us. We're not, we didn't kill them, but we're not going to save them. But he'd sworn a treaty with them, a peace treaty, a, a mutual agreement that says, if you're attacked, we will come and defend you. You know why God used Joshua so much? Because he had integrity. Proverbs says the integrity of the upright guides them. Integrity or lack of integrity will guide the decisions that every decision you and, I, you and I make in our lives, integrity or a lack of integrity, are you going to do the right thing or the easy thing? That's really the question. He could have abandoned them and justified it and rationalized it, but a man of integrity moves into action on his word. And you know what? God honored Joshua and Israel because God honors integrity. And he'll honor yours too. I, I've seen those times where I've compromised and paid the consequences for that compromise. And I've seen the times when, when we have made decisions in this church that says we are going to walk in integrity and God has blessed it every time. Every time. God honors integrity. And once again, God says to Joshua, Fear not, I have given them into your hands. He's saying, Joshua, don't focus on those against you. Focus on the one who is for you. The Bible says he keeps them in perfect peace whose minds are fixed upon him because they trust him. The Bible says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Let us consider him so that we won't grow weary and quit. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. After an all-night march, Israel defeats her enemies, the enemies of the Gibeonites. The Israeli army defeated them and then chased the united forces. Like I said, God rains down hail on the Canaanites, and Gibeon is safe once again. I tried to imagine that scene, what it must have looked like, and I thought, you know, it says that it was after an all-night march from Gibeon to the battlefield that the battle was won. I thought, maybe if more people were willing to lose a night's sleep for the cause of Christ, God would show himself strong on our behalf too. What I mean by that is this. Be willing to be inconvenienced. Be willing to be inconvenienced. God, you know, he, he doesn't seem to work on our time frame. You know, he, he's, he's never late, but he's seldom early. And he, he'll bring opportunities to you when it's not convenient. And that's when God tests and says, are you really for me? Are you really a servant? Are you really willing to reach out to other people even when it costs you something, even when it's inconvenient? The story goes on. We'll, we'll conclude here pretty quick. It says, On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies as it is written in the book of Jasher. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. That's freaky. Can you imagine? You know, historians have gone back and scientists have gone back and they've traced the, the, the earth is missing a day. Now, I don't know how they did it because I'm not a scientist, but secular science says there's a day that's missing in the human calendar and I think it's, it's this day. But can you imagine fighting a battle and all of a sudden somebody looks up and says, Son, stop. And it stopped? Joshua didn't want to be satisfied with just a partial victory. He wanted to finish the task that God gave him to protect the Gibeonites and defeat Israel's enemies. Joshua felt the same way the Apostle Paul did. Think about the Apostle Paul and all of his exploits. 
he almost single-handedly started the New Testament church from city to city to city. He almost single-handedly protected the New Testament church from false teachers and, and false doctrines. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. He accomplished all those things, and yet at the end of his life, he was thinking the way Joshua was thinking when he said, however, meaning, hey, I've, I've, I've accomplished a lot, I've done a lot, I've sacrificed a lot, I've paid a pretty heavy price. However, I'll consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. No turning back. I know there's people here that feel like quitting. I know there's people here that feel like just stopping. I know there's people here that feel like the demands of Christianity or the, the difficulties of life are too difficult. But He will keep you in perfect peace if you fix your mind upon Him and trust Him. No turning back. Joshua prayed a bold prayer. He prayed for the impossible, and guess what? Then he saw the impossible. Joshua believed what God said through the prophet Jeremiah when he said, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? John quoted it earlier. Asking for the sun to stand still is Joshua's way of saying, we're going to fight this battle till we win this battle, no matter how long it takes. I need more hours in a day than 24 to win this battle. And God stopped a universe on the request of one faith-filled man. God's provisions go far beyond natural resources. He provides supernatural resources. Now, it's not very often that dramatic. I don't want anybody out praying that the sun stops this afternoon so we can extend the, the party this afternoon. I tried to get my mind around that and all that took place. And I thought to myself, you know, God stopping a universe on the request of one faith-filled man is amazing. That's got to be one of the biggest miracles in the whole Bible. It's amazing. But you know what's even more amazing? What's more amazing than God stopping a universe is God sending a son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I've said it before. It's a good time to say it again. When God loves, he loves a world and when he gives, he gives a son. And God stopping the son displayed his, er, the, the son, S-U-N. God st stopping the son displayed his power, but God sending his son displayed his love. And that's even more amazing. And I thought the whole course of nature moves or stops at God's command. Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we, if a universe bows the knee to the word of God that says you'll stop, even though you've traversed the same pattern every day for eternity past since I created you and you will for eternity and future till I create a whole new world, th the whole universe stops or moves at God's command and we should too. Well, we'll finish this story in verse 16 of Joshua 10. It says, Now the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Machida. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave, he said, Roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some in there to guard it. But don't stop. Pursue your enemies. Attack them from the rear. And don't let them reach their cities. For the Lord your God has given them into your hand. So Joshua and the Israelites destroyed them completely, almost to a man, but the few who were left reached their fortified cities. The whole army then returned safely to Joshua at the camp, and no one uttered a word against the Israelites. Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. This was not going to be King Appreciation Month. You know they're thinking, oh man. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, Come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. And Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you're going to fight. 
Then Joshua struck and killed the kings and hung them on five trees, and they were left hanging on the trees until evening. Joshua said, don't get distracted. The five kings are hiding in the cave. Don't get rabbit trailed. Don't st- just put the rocks, post a couple guards, and continue on the course that God sent us on. Continue to wage the battle. You know, those five kings ran into those caves, and those, those caves became to those five kings first a refuge, safety. And then it became a prison, and ultimately it became a grave. Just like sin. Sin is a refuge we run to, to dull our senses or to forget about our problems. It can be an addiction, it can be alcohol, it can be pornography, it can be that affair, it can be that job that elevated itself to the number one priority in somebody's life. And and those things become a refuge, but after time they become a prison, and ultimately if, if something isn't done, they become a grave. The lesson is really clear. There's really only one true refuge, and it's God. You know the hymn, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. There's one refuge. David knew that. The writer of the Psalms knew God. And and he had fought the bear and the lion and the giant, and he'd done a lot of things, but he knew there was one refuge. This is what David said. He said, The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Later he said, Show the wonder of your great love, you who save by your right hand those who take refuge in you from their foes. Later, he said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Later in life, he said, taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Toward the end of his life, he said, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. There's only one real refuge. This refuge doesn't become a prison or a grave. This refuge becomes the way, the truth, and the life. We need to learn one other lesson from this story here in Joshua. The lesson is, leave nothing of the old enemy behind that will someday rise to haunt you. He he could have let those five kings go. Their their kingdoms were ruined. Their cities were scattered. But he didn't leave them behind thinking that someday they might rise up again and haunt him. The writer of Romans says, For if you live according to the sinful nature, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of your body, you will live. Paul told the, the Colossians, Put to death, therefore, everything that belongs to your earthly nature. Again, that addiction that compromise or that habit, that attitude, that behavior, that unhealthy relationship, put it to death. You know what God says? God says, I'll kill it if you'll put your foot on its throat. He's saying, I'm not going to yank out of your hand that thing you hold so dear that is imprisoning you and will kill you. But if you'll take out that step and put your foot on its throat, I'll kill it. That's why the writer of Romans says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. It's under our feet, us putting our foot on the neck of of the enemy, but it's God who does the killing. There's There's a cooperation there. He says, if you aren't willing to give up life's dearest pleasures that replace me as the top priority of your life, then you're going to have to live with the consequences. But if you will take whatever step it is to walk away from that behavior, to change that attitude, to excise that person out of your life that shouldn't be there, he says, I'll do the work with you. And then it says, Joshua returned with all of Israel to the camp of Gilgal. Remember Gilgal? That was their spiritual base camp. Remember hearing about Gilgal? Have you been listening? Because I'm gonna, there's a test at the end of this. I'm gonna, <laughs> Gilgal was that place, their spiritual base camp, that place of teaching. It was at Gilgal, remember, that Joshua stood up and he read the entire law of Moses. Gilgal was that place of worship. Remember, the altar was built there, that, that altar that, that would remind them of God's faithfulness in the past and the promises that he had made. 
Gilgal was that place of dedication where the people consecrated themselves and, and were circumcised after 40 years in the desert. It was that place that they would go to for rest and for rep- rep- uh, refreshment. Gilgal was the place God gave them their strategy to win life's battles. It was the place that they prepared for future battles. Gilgal was their oasis. Oasis is our Gilgal, that spiritual base camp. That's what churches are. I remember when we started this thing 35 years ago, and we thought, gosh, we've got to call this something. And I can remember where I was. I can remember the day that I said, Oasis. And then I said, no, that sounds like a bar or a motel. <laughs> the Oasis Motel. But I looked it up in a dictionary, and it said an oasis is a place that is spared the surrounding unpleasantness because water is found there. And I thought an oasis is a place where strangers and weary travelers gather, and they gather there for safety and for rest and nourishment and refreshment and companionship. Everything a church should be. And that's why it's important to return here every week. This isn't something that's just one of many good things in your life. This is a spiritual lifeline that God has designed, not because of who the leaders are, not because of who the members are, but because of who God is. He invented the church, and He created this church to be our spiritual Gilgal, to be our spiritual base camp. Take advantage of what God has provided. Come here to be refreshed. Come here to hear God's word. Come here to actively participate in worship. Remember and celebrate God's faithfulness and the the promises that he's fulfilled when we come here. Come here to become ready to win the battles of life that we're going to face in the future and to possess the promises that God's made. So I'm taking names. I'm going to see everybody here again next week, right? And invite your family and friends to come here. You know, we've just provided an invitation for everybody to you. Just forward it to your friend. This is a place where God comes in spite of us, not because of us. And if that's true, and it is, then don't you want your family and friends to experience Jesus in a way that you don't experience any other time or place throughout the week? That's what churches are supposed to be, oasises. And that's what this one is. So, John, why don't you and the team come up? I don't see John. I think he was raptured. There he is, hiding in the dark shadows. You know what I want to challenge you today with? Today, I want to challenge you to put your foot on the neck of whatever's holding you back. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a behavior. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's a circumstance. But whatever it is, I believe that if you will make a decision today that says, God, This thing, this scenario, this thought, this person, whatever it is, is seated on the top priority of my life, and that seat belongs to you. And I want to dethrone that thing. And I can't do it on my own, but I know that you've promised to help. That's one of the promises we're going to possess. So I'm going to put my foot on the throat of whatever it is that's preventing me from becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And I know with my foot on its throat, you'll put it to death. That's the challenge today. It'll be a personal demonstration to God of your devotion, and it'll be a personal demonstration for you that you have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Let's pray. Father, the opportunity for turning back is so frequent, so strong sometimes. Lord, so so often we find ourselves in seasons of difficulty and seasons of challenge and confusion and discouragement and all those things. We, Lord, we've, we've come to a spiritual base camp that you started 35 years ago, and I pray, God, that we would receive the benefits of all that you intended it to be, not because of the church, but because of the, the one who created this church. God, we come to you. You are the only refuge, and we seek no other refuge. But we say to you once again, God, we have decided to follow Jesus, and we won't turn back. In Jesus' name, amen.